Welcome to another presentation in our series, Rereading Revelation. We are rereading this book in pursuit of its vision of healing. And we are in the home stretch now, uh, focusing, uh, focusing on six visions of healing at the end of the book. And the title of this one, the, uh, this is number 23 in our series, is The Tears. The focus on the tears in the ending of this book. And uh, these uh, concluding presentations, we did uh, Revelation and the Name already, now Revelation and the Tears, Revelation and the Earth, Revelation and the City, the Nations, and then a concluding reflection on time. And we have organized, I have organized these with the name at the center, not time at the center, but the name as the main uh, errand and mission of this book. And here you have it in pictures again with the name at the center and then tears and earth and city and nations. And yes, we will also talk about time. It's not that time doesn't matter. But the name is the main thing. The name is Revelation's foremost concern, God's name. To reveal the name, to inscribe the name, to make sure we know the name. That's the main thing. And still we had this term, then a name that no one knows, a kind of, uh, the sort of a, a subjective uh, element, a, a uh, communication that happens in the private sphere and not only in the public sphere. So let's look at some tears. <coughs> This is a scene from a painting from uh, the year 1540 uh, by, a, I think, a Dutch painter. I saw it in the art museum in, pra in Prague. Uh, and it is not a pretty picture. Nothing about it is pretty. This is a, a, a painting maybe meant in a sort of uh, sarcastic or ironic way about a wedding scene, an older man who marries a not totally young a bride and she it's against her wishes this is relational unhappiness in a big way and you can see how how uh, sad she is and you can see this dynamic there are many <coughs> marriages that are happy there are some that aren't and there are many millions of people entering into relationships today against their wishes so there are tears or this one <coughs> this is by the Norwegian painter Edvard Munch, who is by far our most famous painter, and it's called In the Sick Room. And you can see silent grief, not necessarily so many tears here, but someone is dying in that bed. And the family, older, younger, are in some ways in states of disconsolation. And you can see the privacy of grief, how everyone seeks a certain space for their grief. That's how it is, the sort of solitude of grieving. It's not all the, something that you can all do together. <clears throat> or then the grief of the 20th century where the mountain of grief and the ocean of tears somehow exploded to uh, proportions I say this advisedly, never seen before in history. I'm using the German artist Kate Kollwitz <coughs> to illustrate it uh, here, uh, scenes of grief that she <coughs> depicts in a, in a very evocative way. And you can see the <coughs> Holocaust uh, 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 impression or tenor of this, this particular uh, uh, painting here. And I will have another one. This is a recent local grief in Norway. Uh, and I share this very uh, carefully, very, uh, I want to be very circumspect. But this happened in our royal family. The son-in-law of our king committed suicide. That's him. And this is his daughter, his daughter, his very lovely daughter giving a speech that just riveted the nation about <coughs> the grief she felt at the loss of her father. And you can see here in the, loss, in the face of our king, 
grief written large, sort of numb, and the family here. So there is, there is grief in various levels, and we see it, and we wonder what our remedies could be. <coughs> so in a sort of general representation of tears, there could be tears of loss, of disappointment, tears of regret. We wish that had not happened. We wish we hadn't done it. There are tears of harm, tears of hurt, on tears in relation to injustice, and tears of failure sometimes. And I have done things at times where I had hoped to do it a certain way and it didn't quite work out that way. And maybe I didn't have tears exactly, but I had a sense of, of, of failure, something close to tears. <clears throat> and then we read in the book of Revelation, in the home stretch of this book, that there is an interest taken in the tears of human experience. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, uh, the dwelling place of God is among human beings. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. And God will wipe away wipe every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Nor grief, nor wailing, nor pain will be any more, for the former state of things has passed away. And this text is found in the context of a series of things that will be no more. The sea was no more, death will be no more, grief will be no more, wailing will be no more, pain will be no more, all things accursed will be no more, night will be no more. So these are in some ways the middle ones here in white. They are uh, representations of grief or pain in a, in a physical sense, you may say. But the first one and the last one, they, are, they have a theological tenor. The sea is a, an image of, of evil. Uh, of chaos, and it will be no more. And night, darkness, is also an expression of the darkness that is theological, and the night, the theological night, will be no more. So for me as a physician, too, having worked much of my career, and especially the last several years, in the scene of death and grief and wailing and pain. This, these are, of course, images that, uh, that resonate and that, that really, really have, that really sound, uh, sound beautiful. <coughs> so, to <coughs> put some of these things together, we could say uh, in the descriptive uh, uh, side of it that there are tears <coughs> and now, having read Revelation, we see that God is aware of our tears. And God's awareness of our tears is rooted in the name. It's rooted in the kind of person God is. So maybe there is a sort of course correction there for us. Some tears leave scars. Will the scars vanish when God wipes away our tears? <coughs> And <clears throat> so on the prescriptive side, uh, or uh, tears belongs to states of brokenness, we have to assume that they, are in a, uh, they represent a state of incompletion, something that ought not to be there, but it's there, and it's not that easy to fix it. And then in my <coughs> university community at Loma Linda, we have the concept of wholeness. And the concept of wholeness is a beautiful concept. It is also a risky concept, given the size of the brokenness. So when we invoke concepts of wholeness, we must not oversell what we offer and sort of uh, uh, put in a, an unrealistic vision of what wholeness means in human experience today and what it means 
against the horizon of a book like Revelation. So, <coughs> so there is in Loma, in, uh, Loma Linda is, uh, means that's a Spanish word for, for um, uh, beautiful, Loma Linda, the beautiful hill. And I asked a friend of mine that maybe we should uh, reposition ourselves and say, not beautiful hill and not the hill of wholeness, but Loma Rota, that we live on the hill of brokenness and that we describe the world and witness in the world in a state where we are aware and acknowledge brokenness, including our own brokenness. <coughs> well, that's a little bit of a personal take on that, having, won having wondered about it and worried a little about it, that our proportions are not uh, totally correct. <coughs> so, what I want to say is, in sort of balancing the proportions between theology and therapy, that after all the good therapy has been done, there will still be something for theology, something left over for theology to do, something that has to happen outside and that is bigger than what humans can, can uh, provide. The text in Revelation 21, No More Tears, has a complementary text in Revelation in, uh, chapter 7, uh, uh, where there is this scene, <coughs> they will hunger no more, they will thirst no more, the sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And again, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So twice in the book of Revelation there is explicit mention of the tears that are still there and that seem to remain in some ways until we come to the world, uh, the world to come. Uh, the Old Testament background uh, material for these visions uh, is, un is not to be, uh, it's not unexpected that that might be from the book of Isaiah, whose contribution to Revelation is, in my view, bigger than any other book. <coughs> <coughs> he will swallow up, up death forever, we read in, in Isaiah. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. So we have it already in the Old Testament vision of God. Wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So this is a, a, a great vision that underlies Revelation's uh, 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 use of it. The name and the most troubling tears. What are the most troubling tears? Well, those are the tears that we cry when we feel abandoned, when we feel uh, the, that the God is absent. That's the worst thing. My tears, here in Psalms, my tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? So this is a sort of barb added to the state, the human experience, that the, the sense of being abandoned and people noticing that that experience must mean that you have been abandoned by God. And <clears throat> this text here uh, that counters that feeling, that says, well, the tears are not unnoticed even though our experiences are troubling. Here the psalmist again says, You have kept count of my changing circumstances. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your ledger? So there is a record kept of the tears we cry. And again, in the end, they are to be, uh, to be wiped away. And here this is a, like a bottle sent from above to uh, say, my tears in your bottle, uh, you get the point. <clears throat> I'd like to ask this question, what, which matters most to God 
our sins and our tears. I'm not obviously going to say that our sins do not matter to God, but our tears also matter to God. And maybe there has been a disproportion in the way we have emphasized the importance of our sins at the expense of the meaning and importance of our tears. So just to try that out. <coughs> tears and scars are related. <coughs> so there is a residue in you experience. So we had a bad, a negative experience. We, we experienced something horrible, some loss, something that, that uh, we move on. But we move on and something is there. There is a, a, a scar left. Even in nature, that's the case. Here are scars in a tree trunk. This one here from where they can see it, they can spot it uh, from an avalanche. And the tree is scarred. And here uh, I have been helped to see this, that these are scars left from fires that this tree experienced. And a forest pathologist by the name of J.S. Boyce, he says that the ravages of many a forest fire of a bygone age may be read today in the scars left in the tree itself. The exact year that the fire occurred uh, and some idea of its intensity are recorded in the wood, oftentimes grown over with living tissue and hid from the casual observer. I think this way of seeing nature, seeing scars left, sort of wounds uh, that have healed in nature, uh, also uh, must be a part of human experience and obviously much bigger in human experience than what we see in inanimate nature. So <clears throat> a couple of scenes here from the Bible of tears and scars <coughs> without reading into the Bible something that, that isn't there. This is again William Blake's <coughs> representation of the murder of Abel. And Cain is running away here in a ball of fire. And Adam is looking and he is uh, grief struck. And Eve, you see her with her hair enveloping the face of her deceased son. And I will not make stuff up if I say that the scar from that experience is going to be with her for the remainder of her life. She will always have that room in her memory where that experience will be alive. So tears and scars. So when God wipes away tears, does he also deal with the scar? Is that possible? The other scene here is the scene of <coughs> uh, depicting Abraham, I think. This is Hagar, and this is Ishmael, and this is <coughs> sending her away, and she has tears. Does she ever, how does she deal with that? I plan to write, I am working on a manuscript I have just barely started, but I want to write about the broken hearts of women in the Bible. And it is related to this topic, and yes, Hagar will be one of my characters. Tears we have, and scars. <coughs> and this one, this is uh, 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 the uh, re picture that I have shown already about the uh, garment of Joseph uh, here, and the report that he has been killed. Uh, and the father grieving. And I'd like to take you into the story of Jacob here uh, toward the end of his life uh, when he sort of, uh, he does an account of his life. First, he talks about God's faithfulness here, uh, <coughs> that in he, here he's blessing his sons. He blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my ancestors Abraham and Isaac walked the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, bless the boys, and in them let my name be perpetuated. 
and the name of my ancestors Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude on the earth. So here in Jacob's blessing of Joseph, he talks about God's faithfulness. And it, it's, an, uh, it's a very resounding statement of faith. But here, a chapter or two, or a chapter earlier, when he arrives in Egypt and, and, and talks to Pharaoh, he's 130 years old. I think he's, he lived another 17 years according to the Old Testament. But here he meets Pharaoh, and listen to what he says. Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my earthly sojourn are 130. That's how old he is at the time. Few and hard have been the years of my life. So in translations, the word few is in all the translations. But the word hard is has different uh, uh, connotations and translators have have uh, uh, been a little reluctant how to how much to say it one translation says evil and evil is a good word for the uh, hebrew word that is translated few and evil have been the years of my life few and bad few and unpleasant few and difficult few and painful indeed few and unhappy have been the years of my life. So this is Jacob sort of looking back as a believer, affirming the presence of God, the participation of God in his life, reporting to Pharaoh, it wasn't easy. So there are scars, and maybe this one was one of the biggest ones, the day when they came and told, them, told him that, that Joseph had been torn to pieces by animals. I have another one, there is more, uh, more uh, uh, contemporary one. This is the Jewish writer, philosopher Jean Amery, who uh, was a Holocaust victim and was tortured in connection with the Holocaust. And I have, I'm sad to say that he uh, died after the war at his own hand because of the scars. The scars were just too big. So he talks about the permanence of tears in a human being's experience. Uh, it was over for a while. It still is not over. 22 years later, I'm still dangling over the ground by dislocated arms, panting and accusing myself. In such an instance, there is no repression. Thus one repress an unsightly birthmark and this one, permanently scarred, and the limits of therapy for these types of experiences. Whoever was tortured stays tortured. Tortured is ineradicably burnt into him, even when no clinically objective traces can be detected. Everything looks good on the outside, on the outside but on the inside there are wounds, scars, memories. The permanence of torture gives the one who underwent it the right to speculative flights, which need not uh, uh, be lofty ones and still may claim a certain validity. So you get the point, and we see that the things accumulate in experiences and that the promise in Revelation that there will be an end to tears is really addressing a huge, huge part of human experience. I think this might be my last example, and <coughs> I have written about <coughs> Dostoevsky, the author of this book, and the, the brothers Karamazov in my book, God of Sense and Traditions of Nonsense. I would have liked to include this scene at the end of the book. <coughs> Let me just leave that one in place. So this, the brothers Karamazov are four brothers, and they have a very bad father. Three of the brothers are full-blooded uh, full, full uh, brothers. They have the same mother, and one of them is a brother by another mother. And in the course of the book, the father is murdered. And <coughs> one of the sons, there is a relation to the sons. It is actually the half-brother who has murdered the father. But it is one of the full brothers 
who is accused of the murder and actually sentenced for it. He is f found guilty. The jury found him guilty. But then at the end of the jury trial, uh, there is a defense lawyer who gives a speech <coughs> about about the, the person, the defendant. His name is Mitya, and uh, that's, that's the, the short for his, his name. And he defends Mitya by saying that, that uh, so he didn't do it, he's innocent, but there is circumstantial evidence connecting him to the site, so the jury will find him guilty. But in the eyes of the community, he will be innocent. He is not going to be, uh, they do not think that he is guilty. And that is partly because of the lawyer saying, well, he didn't do it. And then he said that he had a really, really bad father. If, if, uh, uh, if he had done it, it would not have been very strange because this father had treated him so horribly, so absolutely horrible, and I don't need to go into detail. When the defense lawyer gets to that point in the argument, something remarkable happens. It happens twice in the audience, not the jury now, but the audience, everyone who is present. When he speaks about the injustice experienced, the harshness of life, the cruelty, the neglect, the bad fathers they also have had. This is what Dostoevsky says. Thus Fetoyukovich concluded. And the rapture that burst from his listeners this time was unrestrainable. To restrain it now was unthinkable. Women wept. Many of the men also wept. Even two of the dignitaries shed tears. So here there is a flood of tears coming at the end of this jury trial of Mitya, who is sentenced for killing his father. He didn't do it, but he had a difficult experience. So the tears here are compassion for Mitya, lack of love experienced in his life, healing his grief. But it is also a setting where you come into contact with your own grief, where his problem, his experience, triggers awareness of our own experience, lack of love in their lives. And there is a theological tenor to this experience in Dostoevsky, a deeper grief, lack of love in relation to God. And this type of tears, because The name has been misperceived. The name and the tears, there has been no sense that God cares about our experiences and that God is present in our lives. So there is uh, uh, three levels here of <coughs> tears and it has moved me greatly to see it. So <coughs> we are now in a state of incompletion in the eyes of Revelation. Tears, loss, hunger, thirst, heat and a state that is not, in significant ways, not subject to human therapy. And then we have a horizon of completion, of healing. When the text says that God will wipe away every tear, it means that there are tears left that God alone can wipe away, and God will do it. So. <coughs> In concluding here, wholeness in this life is not on offer, brokenness is. But that is not to say that we should not seek therapy. I'm not a nihilist in that regard, whether medicine or psychiatry or counseling or anything. It's not to say that, it's just to say that the, some things are too deep and we face our lives, we have life's reckoning in a state of incompletion certain visions of completion, theologically and otherwise, are per, uh, perceptively shallow and prescriptively misguided, and I don't need to say more about that. And then I wish to end again. So we are going to end on this <coughs> 
phrase uh, from the broken hill and that is a phrase from a, another song by Leonard Cohen. Uh, the song is called uh, If It Be Your Will. And there is that song, and it's a vision of healing, just like the previous one, the Come Healing song. Uh, and it is a song sung not from a hill of wholeness or even from the hill that is beautiful, but from a broken hill, from within, side, the human experience, quite a bit like the book of Revelation assumes the human experience to be. <coughs> so this song uh, is performed many times, of course, but this one I think is from Belfast in July 28, 2009, and the title of the song is If It Be Your Will. It begins with the aging singer uh, just reciting it in, <coughs> in his very sonorous voice, If It Be Your Will that I speak no more, and my voice be still as it was before. I will speak no more. I shall abide until I am spoken for, if it be your will. That is to say, if brokenness is a disqualifying condition, if brokenness disqualifies from bearing witness, then he will be still. But if Brokenness does not qualify, disqualify. If brokenness in some ways is not a problem but a premise for the witness, then maybe he will speak. If it be your will that a voice be true from this broken hill, I will sing to you. So here tears and brokenness and grief are actually where the platform on which the, uh, the person will stand. And then he turns it over to his singers, the Web Sisters, and they will now sing what he has just recited, uh, and the same words as we have here. <coughs> and then uh, they uh, <coughs> uh, going on in the in the song uh, again, emphasizing the brokenness from this broken hill. All your praises they shall ring, if it be your will to let me sing. Then as broken, he's qualified. And a witness that arises from awareness of brokenness is not necessarily the second best witness when the horizon is revelation and someone who ultimately can remedy the brokenness of experience. If it be, be your will, if there is a choice, let the rivers fill, let the hills rejoice, let your mercy spill on all these burning hearts in hell, if it be your will to make us well. And here, burning hearts in hell is not eschatological hell, it is the presence, you know, to let your presence be felt and be, uh, become aware, uh, uh, we become aware of it in, in, the, in the context of present experience, if it be, be your will to make us well. Is it? Revelation says that it is his will to make us well. And then uh, they, at the end of the song here, uh, Cohen re-emerges in the background. He doesn't say anything more. He leaves it to the Web Sisters to take it home and draw us near and bind us tight. All your children here in their rags of light. Light is an emblem of healing, completion, but rags are not. So he mixes up the metaphor of healing and brokenness to sort of unite them. Rags of light, how is that for a dress? In our rags of light, all dressed to kill. And that's where the uh, man says to the, his, his wife or his girlfriend, you are really dressed to kill tonight. <coughs> so you are well dressed when you are dressed to kill. That, I had a hard time understanding that when I first saw that phrase, but now I understand it. In our rags of light, all dressed to kill. And end this night if it be your will, if it be your will. And Revelation says, yes, it is God's will to end this night and to bring healing to our experience. No more tears. 
the discovery that the name cares about our tears could be a corrective to how we think about the name. Tears are an expression of brokenness and incompletion. In God's eyes, they are the promise and not the premise and not the problem. That is to say, God is not offended by our tears. He is not offended by our need. <clears throat> and our witness originates in a state of brokenness, cognizant of who we are and of our need. So that is the end of my presentation on Revelation and the tears.